Hey, good evening. Well, that's a quick fade. <laughs> uh, good evening and welcome. Sorry, I lost my... Anytime anything happens that throws me off my usual patter, I'd completely lose track of what I'm saying, and it's just very confusing. Anyway, uh, good evening and welcome, despite the quick fade. Uh, you are listening to... See you immigration here on WRFU LP Urbana 104.5 FM. I will be your host for this evening. My name is Mr. Garza, and I am here to let you know that WRFU is an open forum for the Urbana Champaign community. Views expressed are those of the speakers and are not intended to represent WRFU, UC IMC, Urbana Socialist Forum, or as we like to say on the televised version of this show, UPTV. These views are our own, and by our in this instance, I mean myself. That's it. That's all I've got. Just me. Me, myself, and I uh, will be having a, a, a quiet discussion amongst ourselves with you, the listener, uh, trying to speak over this hum that I can hear. I don't know if you can hear it, but it's very loud. I wonder where it's coming from. Anyway, I don't know. Is that it? No, that's not it. No, no, no. I don't know. Anyway, there's a hum in my ears. If if there's not in your 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 ears your ears, that's good. I hope there's not, but uh, I can hear it and it's loud. It sounds like a machine right underneath me, except there's no vibration. Anyway, uh, be that as it may. Welcome to the show. Uh, we'll probably be speaking about DACA since uh, stuff is happening there or, or not happening or sort of both happening and not happening at the same time. Happening by not happening, if we can call it that, something like that. Um, and, I, and I suppose it, it bears reminding the listener why we talk about that topic so much. Um, Partly because, well, one, I have a lot of friends who, who have DACA, and uh, I'm concerned about what's going on, so I pay more attention to that topic than some. But also, I think um, it's important to remember that uh, DACA recipients are, in a sense, in a way, like the canary in the coal mine, as far as uh, immigrants generally go, because uh, they are the ones who, well, it's sort of like backwards canaries, if you if you will, because the canary in the coal mine, the canary would be the first to suffer if, you know, the air was going bad and then other more robust um, individuals who happened to be in the coal mine could get out while the getting was good. You know, poor canaries didn't last, but they at least, uh, you know, helped everybody else get out. Uh, DACA recipients are kind of like reverse, reverse canaries in the sense that they are, should be, ideally, <laughs> the hardiest of immigrants in terms of uh, being resistant to bad treatment, bad press, um, you know, the, the kind of anti-immigrant hatred that you see uh, being so prevalent in some quarters, they should be the most resistant to that. And so when they suffer, when even they suffer, you know things are bad for everybody else. And, and so that's one reason why we talk about them a lot, because it's like if we can't pr protect the dreamers generally, um, then there's not going to be much hope for us to protect anybody else. Um, and, and so it's it's important to discuss that topic for that reason, I guess. Um, and and which brings me to, I'm going to start off with an article which is, is really interesting. The, the headline jumped out at me, you know, related to this. Uh, and I thought it was really surprising. And I'm, I will be looking forward to seeing what this is about. It's entitled Koch, Koch, is it Koch or Coke? Koch brothers, the Koch brothers, Koch. Koch backed group launches ad to pressure Congress to protect dreamers. And and here's my point right here. Even the Koch brothers, um, who are not noted for their uh, 
lefty viewpoints on anything, even they have uh, their backing a protection of the dreamer. So, you know, that's got to be that that says something right there about this. So let's just find out what this is about. I, I think it sounds interesting. So I'll read it to you real quickly here. A group backed by the influential Koch network on Monday launched a dig digital ad pushing for permanent relief for undocumented immigrants brought into the country as children as the group increases pressure on Congress to protect dreamers. The ad titled, We Are Patriots, will run on Facebook, Twitter, and Google. It highlights dreamers as Americans and patriots and incorporates messages of economic and family values as an appeal to conservative audiences. This is the first ad campaign specifically on the fate of dreamers by the Libre Initiative, one of the constellation of groups funded through the Koch network, and its first major immigration ad push since the Gang of Eight immigration negotiations in 2013. Monday's ad launch is a part of the group's broader immigration advocacy on behalf of hundreds of thousands of dreamers who could face deportation as soon as March 5th. The Libre Initiative is mobilizing grassroots activists in 11 states and the district, targeting Spanish language media and advocating on Capitol Hill. This situation has an expiration date. We can't afford to kick the can down the road. Daniel Garza, president of the Libre Initiative, said in an interview, we need to stir it up and make sure they, lawmakers, come up with something permanent. Garza said the group wants to put community pressure on immigration hardliners to come around on dreamers while supporting lawmakers who are working to resolve the issue. Garza declined to put a dollar amount to the ad buy beyond describing it as a six-figure campaign saying the group is prepared to spend money as necessary to reach a policy solution for dreamers. This is policy that allows DACA dreamers to achieve their dreams but also strengthens America, Garza said. We are all in on getting a reform that is going to happen, that is going to allow that to happen. The Koch Network, led by billionaire industrialist Charles Koch, has praised the immigration framework President Trump lo rolled out last month, which supports granting permanent legal status to Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program enrollees and increasing border security. But Trump's program also would limit family-based legal immigration. Oh. The Koch Network has said it cannot support arbitrary caps on legal immigration. Garza said the group is working on areas of common ground with the Trump administration on dreamers and border security and is pushing for lawmakers to act on both, but it will hold its line on legal immigration. We just need to know there's going to be no reduction to legal immigration, he said. So that, I thought that was very interesting. And it brings up a couple of questions that leap, leapt, leapt? sorry, leapt to my mind as I was reading it. And one is, is this part of some plot somewhere? Or is this as, as straightforward as it sounds? Um, and it sort of answered at the end of the article my, my thought about it being a plot, because one could, in pursuit of uh, damaging legal immigration, as Trump's plan does, and as is now it seems to be a kind of a standard GOP talking point uh, or, or point of interest. Um, you could push for action on dreamers as, as a way of saying, oh, look, you know, these people are worthy. No one else is. Everyone else, yeah, let's get rid of them. But these people are worthy. So, I mean, that's basically what Trump was doing in a way, or that's at least the the kind of the game he was playing, obviously what he was doing is, is holding DACA recipients hostages in pursuit of drastic reductions in immigration across the board, legal immigration. So the whole concept of, you know, uh, stand in line and follow the rules and, and you'll get in, well, obviously you won't because they don't want you to. They want you to just, they don't want there to be a line for you. They may be lines for somebody else, but not for you. And so that's, that was Trump's plan, and that's what they've been sticking to, and that's why they sabotaged uh, the Senate deliberations um, a while back, was because they want reductions in legal immigration. They want less immigrants 
across the board coming into this country. They want to shut the doors, basically, and, and as much as possible and keep whoever's here here and get rid of as many people that they don't want here as they can. And that seems to be the plan or, or part of their plan. So I was thinking at first that this Koch brothers initiative was kind of based around supporting that idea obliquely by saying, oh, let's support the dreamers. And the best way to do that is the president's plan, which would, you know, blah, blah, blah. But apparently that's not what they're saying or that's not how they're saying it. So this may very well be just a reasonable push to protect dreamers. And if so, that's great. We'll take help from anybody we can get it from. Even those guys, and they are uh, pretty much bad news across the board. But, you know, they support arts and they do all sorts of things. So it's not, it's not like people are all bad or all good anywhere. They're, you know, we're all a mixture of different things. And this just happens to be apparently a good thing that they're doing. And, and I support that effort right there. The border security stuff is just sheer nonsense. But, you know, it is what it is. Anyway, so that gives you a sense of, of just how golden, <laughs> if I could put it that way, the dreamers are in the grand scheme of immigration in this country. If uber conservatives like the Koch brothers can be supporting dreamers, that's got to tell you something about... Uh, you know, the status of that group in relation to all immigrants around the country. And, and so because they're, they are a specific group, I mean, I know lots of different immigrants and, and many who are, are, shall we say, not blessed with the entire uh, array of documents that one might wish to be in order to be fully uh, embraced <laughs> by the, the uh, U.S. government. But, uh, and many of them have really compelling stories, but they're individual stories. So you have individuals where you, that you can point to and say, oh, look, this person has been here for 30 years. They're a part of their community. They, they do community service. They give back to others. They're loved and, and embraced and all these different things. And, and you know, this person has a great story, but it's an individual story. And even though you can kind of generalize on a lot of the points, the farther, the wider you cast your nets, the harder it becomes to do that. And so um, the harder it becomes to use these as individual, you know, representatives of, the, of a group because they're, they're only a group by virtue of being immigrants. They're, and then beyond that, it's like everybody has an individual story and an individual situation. But the dreamers have one consistent factor across the board for all of them that puts them into a category that you can generalize and say, yeah, but they were brought here as kids. They had no control over it. It's not their fault and so on. So. It, that gives them a sort of a group status and makes it easier to identify them as a group, to sympathize with them as a group, and to advocate for th on their behalf as a group. So I think that's all really very important um, in, in sort of tracking public feelings, uh, feelings that the, the gauge the temperature of the public about immigration um, <clears throat> because when the public generally or if not when gosh listen to me that's terrible uh, if the public were to generally turn against the dreamers um, in the same way that there has been this uh, large turn against immigration immigrants generally um, then you could say we're in desperate shape you know but as long as people are uh, looking at dreamers and going, yeah, but they're different. They deserve something more. They're, you know, whatever. As long as there's some sympathy there, some openness to listening, then there is still the possibility of bringing stories in, of bringing information in and 
swaying opinions and easing some of the tension around this topic. I mean, it doesn't help, obviously, that we have this whole, the administration and this whole list of uh, Republican hardliners who are uh, constantly trying their best to create a counter narrative to that and say, oh, they're all bad. They're all, you know, um, <clears throat> awful people and, and they're, uh, I don't know what, criminals and rapists and murderers. Anyway, let me read this. Um, this, this gets at this point right here. This is from The Hill. Uh, in its title, Immigration Has No Correlation to Crime or Terrorism in the U.S. Uh -huh. So, last week, President Trump threatened to withdraw Immigration and Customs Enforcement and Customs and Border Protection personnel from the state of California because of the lousy management job by state and local officials in enforcing the, enforcing the nation's immigration laws. In issuing this dramatic statement, the president overstated the public safety threat posed by undocumented and unauthorized immigrants. He ignored more serious threats facing the nation, demonstrated a remarkable level of ignorance of how our immigration laws are actually enforced, and sought to demonize state and local law enforcement officials. No surprise here to anyone, but there you go. Uh, president Trump claimed that ICE agents were withdrawn from California. Oh, he, excuse me, claimed that if ICE agents were withdrawn from California, quote, you would see crime like nobody has seen in this country, end quote. This is consistent with other recent statements by administration officials suggesting that immigration, and specifically illegal immigration, is a driving force behind crime and terrorism in the U.S. This is simply not accurate. One only has to look at incarceration rates objective studies of criminal behavior and recent terrorism threat assessments to understand that immigrants, even those here illegally, are not responsible for a disproportionate amount of crime and mass casualty attacks in the U.S. In fact, immigrants, regardless of citizenship status, are less likely to engage in violent criminal activity than those born and raised in the U.S. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. In fact, I will say it again. Immigrants, regardless of citizenship status, are less likely to engage in violent criminal activity than those born and raised in the U.S. Studies of the ICE Secure Communities Program reveal that aggressive enforcement of our immigration laws has no appreciable impact on local crime rates. In addition, when examining terrorism-related incidents and other mass casualty attacks, the overwhelming majority of the perpetrators of these attacks were individuals born in the U.S. The president seems to believe that immigration enforcement is a responsibility equally shared by federal, state, and local authorities. Again, this is not accurate. Immigration enforcement is exclusively a federal responsibility. In fact, without being federally deputized, state and local law enforcement personnel have no authority to detain and incarcerate individuals solely for the purpose of enforcing federal immigration laws. It is not the responsibility of state and local authorities to enforce our immigration laws. The primary responsibility of state and local law enforcement officials is to protect their communities from crime and violence, regardless of whether the criminal is an immigrant or native-born. To be effective, they must focus on their activities on those who actually commit crime. They also need to build lines of communication with members of the public, even those that live in immigrant communities. Diverting their attention from actual crime and effective crime prevention strategies simply to support the anti-immigration agenda of the administration would distract them from their primary mission and make our communities less safe. For over 32 years, I, the author, have had the honor to work with federal, state, and local law enforcement professionals to protect our nation from crime and national security threats. I, the author, have put my life on the line and worked with countless others who have as well. I, the author, am confident that state, county, and local officials view it as their sacred duty to work with federal authorities to investigate gangs, arrest violent criminals, and stop terrorist and other mass casualty attacks. But these same state, 
county and local officials have to work under the state and local laws that govern their behavior. To suggest that state and local officials are unwilling to detain individuals on behalf of ICE because they want to protect violent criminals is inaccurate and insulting to the hundreds of thousands of state and local officers who put their life on the line daily to protect our communities. It is important to note that for many jurisdictions, holding an individual in custody solely based on an ICE civil detainer could potentially subject that jurisdiction to civil liability. In an effort to foster cooperation with the federal partners, a number of local jurisdictions have asked ICE to provide a court order akin to an arrest warrant so that these localities can hold an individual for ICE without getting sued a request that so far ICE has been reluctant to put into widespread practice. I understand that for this administration, immigration and immigration enforcement is a political priority. I also understand that the threat to withdraw ICE and Customs and Border Protection from California may have been nothing more than political theater. I mostly definitely agree that it should be a top priority for all law enforcement officials across the nation to work together to prevent crime and violence in our communities, irrespective of whether it comes from the actions of an illegal or legal immigrant or native-born person. While demonizing state and local officials and embellishing the threat posed by illegal immigrants may gratify the president's political base, it also undermines and erodes the very operational relationships that are vital to protecting our communities from violence. Furthermore, it distracts us from dealing with the serious threats actually facing the U.S., such as mass attacks, casualty attacks by disaffected individuals, such as those recently experienced in Parkland, Florida, Sutherland Springs, Texas, and Las Vegas, protecting our elections from interference by hostile foreign nations, dealing with extreme, violent extremism and international terrorism, and addressing the deadly opioid crisis. This was written by John Cohen, a professor at Rutgers University. He worked as a law enforcement and homeland security uh, individual for over 32 years in both Republican and Democratic administrations. So, that reiterates once again a point that I've made a million times, which is obviously that immigrants are not <clears throat> criminals any more than anyone else is, and, a, and certainly often less than people who were born here in the United States. That's not to say that all immigrants are walking around with little halos over their heads and and helping old ladies across the street and things like that. They are human beings, just like everyone else, and there are good ones and bad ones and everything in between. So uh, lest naysayers feel compelled to go, yeah, but look at this, and point out some person who was uh, documented or undocumented who committed some horrible crime. Yeah, I'll accept that somewhere there is somebody who did that and that, yes, they were, in fact, possibly or probably an immigrant. And so what? That's my response. What? So what? It doesn't say anything except that immigrants are human beings, just like everybody else. Um, <clears throat> but what these statistics do say, and I don't know why I'm, for you TV viewers, I'm holding this box and waving it around as if it it's full of statistics. I don't know. I just picked it up while I was talking. I gesticulate a lot. Uh, radio listeners don't realize um, because they don't don't see me. <laughs> but if you were to see me talking, you would see my hands waving around quite a bit. I'm I'm very uh, I don't know. I don't know what you call it. It's like uh, it's just something I, I feel compelled to do. I'm. I'm reading. I'm looking off at nothing, really. I'm, I'm generally like not looking at anything while I'm talking. I'm looking sort of toward my computer because it's shiny and bright and it has pictures on it. But <clears throat> I'm talking to you and um, waving my hands around as if you could see me. And you can if you watch the show, although I will not be looking at you because in order to do that, I have to turn sideways and and talk like this and then I can't read. So. Uh, I apologize for always being seen in profile, uh, but that's just the way it is on this show. 
if I could put the camera out in the hallway and point it in, I might do that, except that I could easily see someone walking up and going, oh, hey, here's a camera, and picking it up and walking away long before I had a chance to do anything about it. <coughs> and you know what? They probably wouldn't be an immigrant if they did that. They might be, but probably wouldn't. Anyway, um, th that's all a long way around saying that immigrants are not a special criminal problem. Um, immigration enforcement is a problem for the government only to the extent that the government makes it a problem um, or sees it or decides that it is a problem. And as I've, I don't know if this was the last show or the show before that I was talking about how uh, there are certainly places uh, where refugees are just like pouring into a country from a, a crisis spot and they're overwhelming that country's ability to house them and feed them. And, and all those things, and they're creating huge problems. We do not have that problem here in this country. Uh, even at times when immigrants were really coming here at, at a rapid pace, um, it was not a problem. There was no, um, you know, refugee camps, immigrant camps. Uh, there were, there, you know, there was nothing. There, there, they aren't like coming up and then running around. Uh, stealing food because they can't find a place to live or to eat or anything. None of that has happened in this country. And it's not liable to because we have lots and lots of space and lots and lots of food and lots and lots of jobs and lots and lots of everything um, <clears throat> in great abundance, far more than we need or should have in relation to the rest of the world. But be that as it may, we have plenty of it and there's nothing hurt by people coming in and, and getting bits and pieces of that. So we have not suffered in any way from immigrants coming into this country. <clears throat> and because of that, creating a crisis about immigration is clearly and undeniably a political act. It is not based around anything that's going on. Uh, certainly there was a period during which the economy was doing very badly where people were saying, oh, well, this is the problem. Immigrants are taking our jobs. They're driving down wages, et cetera, et cetera. But the economy picked back up. Immigrants are still here. That's not, that wasn't what was doing it. And, you know, you can look at it and say, okay, what changed between then and now? What changed was the economy. It wasn't the presence of immigrants in our communities. Um, <clears throat> so that that never flew that never flew at all but the problem is the there is a constituency out there for this crisis who believes in it who keeps the crisis atmosphere uh, heat turned up full blast and all that stuff <clears throat> and they are not swayed by reason they don't listen to this show if they listen to this show they'd probably be throwing boots at the radio going that's not true and um, and just arguing with it because they want to believe something else. They feel emotionally that something else is true, and so they believe it. For example, here is a story right here um, entitled, Data Clashes with Emotion as CPAC Immigration Panel Goes Off the Rail. CPAC was Conservative Political Action, uh, Conservative Political Action Conference? Committee? I don't know. Anyway need something. 